Welcome to Theory of Pets. I'm a passionate pet owner with a drive to help others like me uncover the truth about the pet industry and what goes on behind the scenes. Many of us know people who are in a position where they maybe have lost a job or their lifestyle has changed and they're having a hard time paying bills, uh, keeping food on the table, and certainly keeping their pets. We may even know somebody who has lost a pet or had to rehome a pet because they were no longer able to care for it. And this can be an extremely sad situation that breaks the heart of the pet owner, the animal, and everyone else involved. Today, I was able to talk to Kashik Roy. He is the executive director of the Shanti Project, which includes PAWS, PAWS stands for uh, Pets Are Wonderful Support, and these two organizations work hand in hand to try to help people who um, are keeping animals um, for uh, health-related reasons, whether it's emotional or physical, um, and they're struggling. So they um, do a lot of different things to try and keep these animals and their owners together. And uh, I will let Kashik tell you a little bit more about the organizations and what they do. Sure. So I actually got involved with the Shanti Project, uh, which is a longtime nonprofit in San Francisco that PAUSE is now a part of. And at the heart of Shanti, the idea is very simple, which is that no one should have to be alone in the face of some of life's most uh, difficult circumstances. And the reason PAUSE ended up at Shanti, uh, there are many reasons, but one is because at the heart of PAUSE's mission, it's very much the same idea, that no one should be alone uh, when they are sick or in difficult circumstances. Uh, the difference being, of course, PAUSE helps uh, people stay with their pets, uh, whereas Shanti traditionally uh, is more human-to-human or peer-to-peer interactions. But I've been a longtime fan of PAUSE, and it's actually one of the reasons when we were looking at the merger, I think we made the merger happen, is because PAUSE is a very unique story, and in a lot of ways, Paws is a pioneer uh, in this idea of uh, the human-animal bond and how much animals can affect, or how much pets can affect uh, guardians to health. So it actually, Paws, uh, Paws was founded in 1987. Uh, it was in the heart of the AIDS epidemic, and of course, San Francisco is one of the epicenters for the disease, and uh, HIV-positive clients or people with AIDS were coming to the AIDS Food Bank at the San Francisco AIDS Foundation and telling the volunteers they were actually getting the food and feeding it to their pets because they didn't have enough food or the ability to feed both themselves and their pets. And uh, those volunteers in a real act of decency, real human decency, just started collecting cans of pet food along with the human food and started handing that out. And that eventually led to the formation of Pets Are Wonderful Support, which was probably as best as we can tell, uh, the first nonprofit dedicated to keeping marginalized or vulnerable individuals and their pets together when they might otherwise have to surrender their pets. And over the years, there have been many organizations across the country and the world that have been formed based on this idea of how do you provide people what they need to make sure their pets can stay with them and that they can enjoy the, the love and support of their pets. That's fantastic. And there are, um, I live up here in Maine, and even here we have some organizations, and a lot of them work, um, as you described, you know, kind of hand in hand with food banks because they would find the same thing that people were coming for food um, and sometimes sacrificing some of that for their pets. So, what a wonderful way to pair two very similar things together. Absolutely, and it's, I'm glad you brought that up because even now we have a partnership with the Meals on Wheels in San Francisco where oftentimes the Meals on Wheels staff or drivers can ad- identify individuals who are isolated or homebound and could really use some support to keep their pets. And speaking of that, you know, you mentioned that your organization's focus is on the healing aspects of the human-animal bond. Can you discuss why that bond is such an amazing healing power and the mounting evidence that is being done to prove that 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 is true. Absolutely. It's actually a very uh, interesting and very cool time uh, to be 
like us uh, really in support and understand how important animals and pets can be to our health. So I think for uh, as uh, those of us who've been able to either grow up or have the, the love of pets in our lives know, there is something hard to describe, but the form of unconditional love, the lack of judgment, just the presence that our uh, companion animals provide is really in a very, uh, it's very unique, and they provide that love in a very unique manner. The other item that uh, people don't always think about, especially for marginalized individuals, they often are in a position where they don't receive a lot of physical affection. And just the physical affection of, say, cats or dogs who can snuggle with you, who can sit on your laps, who will sleep with you at night, that physical, positive physical touch also has great impact on on our health. Um, and uh, one of the lines I like is that pets are like good social workers, and it's one that we use. Uh, and what we have found over the last 25 to 35 years, as this has been studied more and more, is there really are a lot of direct health benefits. So I think there's physiological benefits, uh, a couple of the biggest, of course, being there is a decrease in anxiety for people who have pets or companion animals, and this, of course, delays so or in some cases allows people to altogether avoid uh, stress-related conditions. Uh, and also they have found that uh, the effect of pets on us can lower our blood pressure in the same way or in a greater way than say some of the traditional dietary changes that are recommended for folks who have high blood pressure and uh, need to lower their blood pressure. Uh, and then there's also a lot of cardiovascular benefits, uh, including a decrease in risks for cardiovascular disease. And there have been so many studies done over the years now where they will look at uh, certain circumstances. So say, for example, if someone were to have a heart attack and they're released from the hospital, and they study those folks who are released and don't have a pet versus those who are released and do have a companion animal. And time after time, those studies show that those who have the benefit and affection of pets or animals uh, typically fare much better. Uh, and then one other thing that just occurs to me uh, more recently is a lot of work is being done in terms of the impact of animals uh, in Alzheimer's patients. And typically what they also find is that uh, for Alzheimer's patients, they will have fewer episodes of aggression or confusion or anxiety than those Alzheimer's patients who may not uh, have the opportunity to interact with companion animals. So it really is uh, a multitude of ways where having companion animals can directly benefit our physical health. And then of course, uh, on an emotional level as well, uh, a lot of research has now been done on just how uh, we are able to decrease our isolation and depression by being around our pets and our companion animals. And then there's one line I really love, if I can share with you, uh, that I came across in some of the research we use at PAUSE, um, which says, oftentimes that the support of a pet is similar to the social support we may receive from friends and family. Uh, but whereas our interpersonal relationships with friends or family can often cause us stress, our relationships with our pets are much less likely to do so. And I think uh, we all know that even though it's a bit of a glib statement, it's really true. There is just something about our pets that they are always there, they are present, they forgive easily, they are authentic and let you know how they're feeling, but they'll always be there and, and love us. Uh, no matter what else is going on in our lives. And that's really an amazing feeling. After years and years of working in the pet industry, that bond is something that just, it fascinates me still. And I, I really love following the research because, I mean, you said it when, when you mentioned that, you know, it's that feeling that we can't really put into words. Nobody can really describe it. We all say we love our animals, but it's so much more than that and so much different than that and seeing the research that's been done in the last few decades on that human animal bond I mean you touched on the emotional side of it the depression the anxiety the stress that it helps with the physical side of it with you know the cardiac um, studies that are being done and and Alzheimer's and things like that and it's just this overall kind of soothing effect that animals have it it's really powerful and, and simply amazing it really is, and so much of the research and so much of our interactions and even our work at PAWS is focused around uh, dogs and cats because they do comprise the majority of pets that are, are owned uh, in, in the country and I think in the world. But what's really interesting is that other folks can certainly get this, derive the same kind of benefits from other animals as well. We have some uh, clients here at Pets who are uh, getting so much love and affection from their birds, and there was a real interesting study done where they found 
down that if someone would just sit and look at fish in an aquarium for 15 minutes, they can identify physical benefits in terms of blood pressure being lowered and the calmness uh, around them. So yes, I think a lot of our work is done around the, the beautiful love of dogs and cats, but it actually goes beyond that as well. Absolutely. And that segues perfectly into my next question. I was going to ask you if there were certain types of animals that uh, seem to have more or less of an effect on a human's health. And if somebody is listening right now and they think, you know, I spend a lot of time at home, I really would like uh, a companion animal, how would they choose which type of animal would be best suited for them? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say, um, the, the, answer, the answer to the first part of your question is a bit skewed because so much of the research really is done around dogs and cats. And I think most of us who've grown up with companion animals, uh, it's usually usually one of those either uh, canine or feline uh, companions. I know animals like rabbits and bunnies are being adopted more and, and the same kind of positive impact uh, occurs. And as I mentioned uh, earlier, birds as well and some people just having fish. Just the idea of having another living presence uh, in our lives, especially if we're homebound or marginalized or extremely isolated, uh, seems to show that there are tremendous benefits to that. If someone were thinking about how to get a companion animal, uh, especially to help them with isolation they may be facing, I think there's a couple of things to keep in mind. One is just what their previous experiences with pets have been like. Uh, if they've grown up with cats or dogs, they might have an affinity for one over the other. But even if they're not sure about that, or maybe they haven't really had a lot of interaction with companion animals before, uh, I think just uh, most cities now have a lot of wonderful animal welfare organizations that have volunteer opportunities. And I would suggest to someone um, to look into that if they're physically capable to volunteer uh, to at either a shelter or a different type of animal welfare organization where they can either maybe take some dogs for walks or spend some time with the cats or the other uh, animals that are surrendered and then kind of have a chance to see what works best for them and what uh, provides some, some meaning and, and calm for them. Absolutely. I, I agree with that. And, you know, to speak on the volunteering aspect as well, there, you know, if you're thinking, I think a dog would be great or maybe a cat, there are different types of dogs, different types of cats. Some cats are more social. Some are, uh, you know, very antisocial and don't really like a lot of human interaction. Dogs are uh, a horse of many colors, that species, you know, big dogs, small dogs, active dogs, less active dogs. So I think volunteering, you know, that's a great suggestion. People can get used to the different animals and the different types of animals maybe to, to pick what would best suit their lifestyle. Yes, I think I think the opportunity to volunteer can be really helpful. Some folks may not be able to volunteer for physical reasons or, or other reasons. Uh, in that case, I know this is a little bit more uh, of a hit or miss situation, but depending on their relationships with their doctors or other medical professions, I think more and more people in the medical field are also aware of the concrete benefits of having companion animals, and perhaps uh, folks in the medical profession uh, can provide some support or suggestions. So a lot of this is depending on where you live and your city or locale as well in terms of the emphasis and attention the human-animal bond gets. And speaking of that, so if someone was interested in getting an animal to specifically aid in uh, their health and well-being, consulting a doctor obviously, um, you know, is a great option. Are there other things that maybe they should do before they think about actually adopting an animal? Uh, yes, I think one of the things to think about is, as this is getting more attention, there is, uh, there's kind of two levels of categorization around animals that can provide us support. There's actually what's referred to as a level of service animals, which is a higher standard, and then support animals. And again, I would ask folks to possibly reach out, if not to their medical professionals, to the human, uh, I'm sorry, the animal welfare, to the animal welfare organizations in their community who will probably have some information. Local laws may differ in terms of what happens if a landlord doesn't want you to have pets for in, in a, uh, your residence or apartment where you're renting. What rights do you have? Uh, some of that depends on whether or not you qualify for having a service animal versus a support animal. But because there is a greater level of attention, I think, on the power uh, that our pets have in, in helping our lives not only be more fruitful and meaningful, but also for us to have healthier lives. Uh, there are more resources, resources out there, and it really depends a lot on the 
community and the, and the city in which you live. Fantastic. And is there anything that our listeners can do to help maybe um, if they're not necessarily right in your area or um, they're not, you know, looking for um, food or help with taking care of their animals, but is there something that they can do to help pause or the Shanti Project? Yeah. Well, I appreciate you asking that. And uh, wearing my executive director hat, I have to bring this up uh, and I have other ideas as well. But the reality is, is that nonprofits, especially community-based nonprofits that are focused on serving the marginalized in our communities, uh, we certainly need the financial support of those who believe in our mission and are passionate about our cause. So, of course, if anyone is in a position and would like to financially support us, we always welcome uh, welcome that type of support. The other thing is we also have a lot of resources that we have helped develop over the years because PAWS really was a pioneer in helping other nonprofits create programs to help vulnerable or marginalized individuals and their pets stay together. So if someone is looking to maybe, uh, if someone is looking to get more resources or even start something around this idea or help something around this idea advance in their community, uh, they can certainly reach out to us. Uh, the website is shanti.org, S-H-A-N-T-I dot O-R-G. And if they contact us, there are some resources on the benefits of companion animals and some other, other things that we can certainly send along uh, so we can Fantastic. And there will be a link to, for anybody that's listening and wants a little bit more information, um, there's a link to Shanti.org just below this podcast. So um, if you're curious, uh, there's some great uh, information on there and and it's a wonderful reference. Or um, of course, if you're interested in donating or reaching out for some more information, um, that's right there. Kashik, thank you so much for your time today. Is there anything else about PAWS, the Shanti Project, or the Human Animal Bond that you'd like our listeners to know? What I would say is that for those of us who've benefited from having companion animals in our lives, and we know firsthand and anecdotally through our, our own lives just how beneficial it is to have companion animals, this is a very exciting time for us. I think it's now becoming much more mainstream as people learn about all the ways animals can support us, and that's ranging from uh, programs that match veterans with PTSD with companion animals, all the way to reading programs uh, for kids who may have trouble reading out loud or stuttering and they read to pets and there have been uh, there has been evidence showing that that helps kids in that situation improve their reading skills and their reading comprehension and everything in between and more and more the human animal bond is going to be a part of our mainstream health and, and medical professions uh just a quick anecdote if i may uh the city of san francisco a few years ago for the first time actually provided support financial support for pause and the reason they did that is they did that through their department of aging and adult services because they realized how having companion animals can help reduce isolation and there is a national organization it's called the n4a uh i think stands for the national association of area agencies on aging and the city of san francisco and pause submitted the pause program and it actually received an innovation award in the annual conference for the n4a so i think it really shows how people even if they're not quote unquote animal folks really appreciate the benefits that we can all have from having companion animals so it's really exciting for all of us love our pets and animals. That's wonderful. Good for you guys. Congratulations on that. That's fantastic. Thank you. The other thing I'd point out is that isolation, putting aside the companion animals or paws for a second, isolation is becoming a very widespread problem in this country and across the world. In fact, uh, President Obama's Surgeon General actually called it an, an epidemic, a public health epidemic. And so I really hope folks in all communities will realize that there is a very effective and cost-effective way, actually, to help support folks who are facing social isolation by helping people get pets and keep them and support them as well. Absolutely. I could not agree more. My thanks to Kashik and the Shanti Project for uh, giving us this great information. Again, those links are right below the podcast uh, if you are looking for more information. And of course, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. You can jump on our website, theoryofpets.com. And while you're there, if you could leave a quick review of my podcast, that would be great. When I reach out to experts like Kashik, it's great to show them that you guys are out there listening and you'd like to hear more. So that really helps me. Thanks a lot for listening this week, guys, and I will be back with another hot topic very soon.